Uh, hi. Um, it's April 7th at 8 a.m. right now. Um, and, uh, well, let's see here. A um, couple things, I guess. Um, one thing is uh, I broke my arm uh, about, let's see, I guess it's two weeks ago today. Um, and I don't have a cast or anything, but I did get a surgery. Um, um, seven, uh, 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 last Monday. So not yesterday, but last Monday. Um, and the surgery seemed to go well. I'm able to use my arm, I think pretty well. I can't quite flex it all the way. So I'm working on that, but, um, uh, I think I can write, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and I think I can, I think I can do what we've been doing, uh, without too much issue. Um, uh, other stuff. So today we're gonna we're gonna talk about something new. We're gonna talk about infinite series. Uh, please be aware that we're gonna have a midterm on Friday, and this midterm is gonna be a group midterm. I'll uh, have more details on that um, for you today. Uh, I will send out an email with a uh, document outlining the points that you need to know in order to. Um, understand what's going on for uh with this midterm okay and again that's happening this friday okay so and it's going to happen during your usual um w whatever section you're enrolled in so if you're enrolled in the 8 a.m section your midterm is going to happen from 8 to 8 50 if or maybe 8 55 uh if you're in the 9 a.m section 9 to 9 50 etc and uh, i don't want to talk too much about what that's going to entail right now um, but, uh, uh, that's something we can talk about soon. Um, let's see here. Uh, so I did have a request. Somebody put in a request for that. I do a problem at the start of today's lecture. Uh, let me pull that problem up. It was one of the problems from, uh, uh the worksheet, namely 20.3. And I'm happy to do that. So, uh, exercise 20.3 uh, asks the following. Uh, we want to test the fall. Uh, I can tell I'm already writing much slower than I usually do. Integral uh, for convergence. And the integral is the integral from 1 to infinity of uh, 2x plus 1 over the square root of 3x cubed plus 8x plus 10 dx. So that's an improper integral there, and we want to uh, figure out whether or not it converges or not. Uh, now, I insist that uh, what you will be able to do before too long is be able to look at something like that and more or less get an immediate picture as to whether or not this converges or not. And the way that you do that is to um, use this idea that, okay, so th this is, uh, we're going to use the limit comparison test. I should say that out front. Sorry. We're going to use the limit comparison test. And the way, what we need to do then is to pick a, another function, which we believe resembles or well approximates this function here, the integrand of this integral, when x is very, very, very large. Right? And the main principle that you should understand that I think is extremely valuable for your life, not just in the context of improper integrals, but in the context of so many things uh, mathematically, is that when you have a polynomial function, when x is very, very large, very extremely big, that polynomial function is well approximated by the highest degree term in that polynomial. So like you see in the numerator, 2x plus 1, that 2x plus 1, when x is very, very large, is going to be very, very well approximated by just the 2x. Forget about the 1. The 1 will pale in comparison to the 2x when x is large. And similarly, if you look at the thing under the square root here, 3x cubed plus 8x plus 10, that's going to be very well approximated by 3x cubed when x is very, very large. I mean, sure, it is true that 8x, for example, this middle term, it's also going to infinity as 8 as x goes to infinity, right? When x is large, sure, 8x is also very large, but it pales in comparison to the higher degree term, 3x cubed. 3x cubed just dominates it. Um, hopefully that's clear. And so um, the hint that I want to give you 
without doing the entire problem because I don't want to spend too much time doing the entire problem. The hint that I want to give you is, um, so if we call this function here our f of x, what we should do is um, use the limit comparison test uh, where g of x is equal to what? Well, what we want to do again is approximate this when uh, x is very, very large. And if we do that, what we get in the numerator is 2x, because that's what uh, a good approximation of the numerator when x is large. And similarly in the denominator, we have the square root of 3x cubed. So if we simplify this, because uh, we are all uh, very good at algebra, if we simplify this expression here, this is the same as 2x over the square root of 3. Now what is x cubed written as a power just of x? The square root of x cubed, rather? Did I say that right? I don't remember. Uh, it's x to the 3 halves, right? Are you following? And we can, of course, simplify this to 2 over uh, square root of 3 times the square root of x. And I would encourage you to use, uh, which of course we can maybe write nicer looking as 2 over the square root of 3x. What have I done? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, and then this is the quantity that we're going to choose for our g of x. What we're going to then do is take the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x over this g of x. Okay? And we're going to do really crispy algebra, okay? super crispy algebra, to make this limit um, uh, tractable, okay? uh, to, to evaluate this limit. We're not going to do anything crazy like L'Hopital's rule, because I think that gets really messy really quickly, given that we have these square roots around. I mean, you could, you could make arguments by swapping square roots and limits and stuff like that. But I think the more straightforward way to go is to just do some, like I say, very crispy algebra. And if you look at the examples that I give you in uh, the sheet, hopefully that will make it clear. Now, my guess, my very uh, educated guess, I would say, is that if you do take the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x over g of x, okay, what you'll find is that limit is equal to 1, which is sort of the statement that f of x and g of x basically look exactly the same when x is very, very, very large. Okay? Um, so if that's the case, then um, you can use the conclusion of the limit comparison test, which tells you that this improper integral of this guy and the improper integral of this guy converge or diverge together. So let me write these things down just the skeleton of this. So you will find that uh, the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x over g of x is equal to 1. Pretty sure that with this choice of g of x, you'll see that this is equal to 1. And so this, says, this means that LCT implies that these two integrals, the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx, which is the given integral, right? That's this integral. And this other integral, uh, this one here, dx, uh, converge or diverge together. Okay, uh, yeah. Now, based upon that, you should know whether or not that guy there converges or diverges. I know whether it converges or diverges. It absolutely diverges, okay? And the reason that I know that is because, okay, sure, we got a 2 there, and we got a square root of 3 there, which maybe gives us a headache, but, I mean, this is just the same thing as the integral, if I pull out those constants, 2 over the square root of 3 times 1 over at, uh, square root of x, excuse me, dx. And that is a p integral, right? With p equal to 1 half. And this thing, therefore, diverges. Okay, so therefore, based upon the LCT and this calculation that we did for the limit, this integral diverges. All right, so that's 20.3. And hopefully um, that makes uh, that problem a little bit clearer. Um, I do want to dive into uh, the uh, new material, but just before I do that, I just want to say really quickly, because this is a very new topic, uh, 
talk about what we talked about last time, which were sequences. So just a very brief review of sequences. Um, by the way, let's see. Um, just checking in on what's going on. Oh, seven people are watching. Hello, seven people. Um, if you want to chat or something like that, ask questions, please feel free to do that. I'm keeping trying to keep my eye uh, out on the chat window. I placed it there because I had nothing else to put there. It seems like a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, please ask questions if you have any questions. Just stop me anytime. Um, which is, if that's the whole point of doing this live stream thing. Um, where am I? Oh yeah, sequences. Sequences. Ah, uh, what am I supposed to say about sequences? Sequences are just ordered lists of numbers. So they're things that look like, you know, you comma separate them. And, you know, we're typically interested in sequences which go on infinitely long like this. Okay. Um, and what's important about sequences is that, uh, you know, they're, they are just, all they are by definition is just an ordered list of numbers. Okay. Uh, I guess, well, whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to go too much more into depth on, on that, I guess. That's just what they are. But sometimes what you can do is uh, give a formula for like the nth term of a sequence. We talked about this, where um, sure we have all of these uh, uh, terms of the sequence. A1 is a term, first term, A2 is a second term, A3 is a third term, etc. But if we want a general formula for finding, let's say, the hundredth term or the thousandth term, what we can do is write down perhaps a formula for the nth term and then just plug in n equal to 100 or 1000 or whatever it is that you're interested in. So we might have some uh, uh, formula, okay, which tells you what the nth term is. I don't know. I'll just make one up, for example, um, n plus 1 over n plus 2, okay? Uh, and then this tells you what the sequence is. So uh, the sequence here is uh, given by, uh, let's see, a sub 1 would be 2 thirds. I think I can do math. Uh, the next would be 3 fourths. The next would be 4 fifths. The next would be um, 5 sixths etc. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. This is the first term. This is what we might be calling A1. This is A2. This is A3, A4, etc. All right? Very simple statement, a very simple definition, okay? It's just a list of numbers. And typically, it's infinitely long for us. And uh, the numbers that we're going to allow ourselves to uh, think about are real numbers, okay? So nothing too exotic. All right. Um, now, one of the things that we concern, or we want to concern ourselves with, is limits of sequences. So uh, we can ask about uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sequence a sub n. This is, uh, I don't know if it's exactly a new concept. I, uh, you know, previously when we've been talking about limits, we talk about them in the context of um, a, a continuous variable x. Uh, running off to maybe infinity or maybe off to some finite number or whatever. This is, strictly speaking, I guess, a new object, but the intuition should be very much the same from what you had previously. So if we're talking about the limit as n goes to infinity of a sequence a sub n, what we mean is a, a value, a number, which a sub n gets closer and closer to as n goes to infinity. That's a very informal definition. It's not one that would satisfy a math nerd like myself. You need to go a little bit more into depth what you mean by gets closer and closer to and all of these kinds of words. But I think for uh, uh, intuition's sake, it's a very good way of thinking about what's going on. I don't think it misses any details uh, when you think intuitively about it. Okay, so we have this uh, uh, idea here. <clears throat> uh, and if, we, if this limit exists, then we say that the sequence is convergent. And if this limit fails to exist, then we see the then we say that the sequence is divergent. Okay, these are words that we've heard before in the context of improper integrals. In fact, right, um, but they get you that those words get used again in the context of sequences, and they're going to get used yet again in the context of infinite series. Though it is the case that infinite series are just sequences in disguise. All right, 
Um, good. I, I, um, okay. I don't know why. I'm just, it's so weird doing this thing online. I, it, you know, it, I'm accustomed to being able to look out into the audience and see how many of you have that glazed over look on your face of absolute confusion. And so I know to sort of stop and slow down, but here I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so um, forgive me if I'm going too fast or if I'm boring you to death, whatever. Uh, what to say next? So this, yeah, um, I'll say it like this. If exists, then uh, we say that the sequence is convergent. Uh, if not, Okay, so very important. So, for example, uh, returning to our example here, we can think about the limit as n approaches infinity of this a, uh, a sub n, so n plus 1 over n plus 2. Okay, and hopefully you've done this enough in your life that you know how to attack this, but I just want to say sort of two uh, ways of going about thinking about this. One way is purely algebraic, I, or maybe not purely is not the right word, I guess, but is to uh, goof around with this thing algebraically, okay, by factoring out highest order powers, highest degree powers, uh, highest degree terms in the numerator and denominator. So one way of attacking this problem is to factor out the n in the top and the n in the bottom. And then noticing that, first of all, these things cancel. The ends cancel each other. And then the second point is that uh, 1 over n and 2 over n, as n goes to infinity, those guys die. And so then this limit is equal to 1. But another way of attacking this problem, okay, which um, is nice, is that you can use, uh, if you can find what's called an interpolating function for the sequence, you can use uh, um, techniques that you know for evaluating limits of functions, like calculus one functions, um, uh, you know, real value functions of a single real variable is what I'm talking about. You can use techniques there to figure out what the value of this limit here is. So an, interp an obvious interpolating function so here's another method. This is using interpolating functions. Is to take the limit as x goes to infinity of x plus 1 over x plus 2. Okay. And uh, sure, you, you could do the same algebraic move here, but the point that I'm trying to make is that a limit like this, you can bring to bear um, uh, techniques that you learned from... Um, uh, uh, calculus to evaluate this limit here, namely L'Hopital's rule in particular, very useful one, right? Um, so that's the point of doing this interpolation thing, is that you can use things like L'Hopital's rule. And if you use L'Hopital's rule, this is equal to um, the limit as x goes to infinity of the derivative of the top, which is 1, divided by the derivative of the bottom, which is also 1. And that's 1. And just to make the point again, because I've and I've made it many times, and I'll probably make it many more times. This is a completely obvious answer given the structure of the thing that we're taking the limit of, right? Because what we know is that when n is very very large, n plus one looks like n. Okay, it's it, it is well approximated by its highest order term. Similarly, n plus two is um, well approximated by just n. The fact that we have a different thing upstairs and downstairs on the constant term actually doesn't matter at all. I could change this to be n plus 1 billion, 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 trillion, 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 etc., 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 okay? And it would not affect the overall value of this limit because n going to infinity means that you're going to eventually find values of n which are far, far greater than any constant you can write down. Okay, and so that this n term here is going to completely dominate the value uh, of n plus 1. 
when n is super, super large, right? The, the, whatever the constant term is won't make any difference in some sense. <clears throat> okay, so that's all I want to say about sequences. I want to move on now to talking about a, a special sort of sequence, I guess, um, which are infinite series. So this is the really new content today, here 20 minutes in. I think that's fair. Uh, infinite series. Um, and I don't want to be too strict about definitions and things uh, uh, of this topic. Uh, uh, so, but I, I do want to give you some intuition about, about this. So infinite series are just sums of infinitely many numbers, okay? Uh, it's an easy thing to say, but it's maybe a weird idea, right? If you add up infinitely many numbers, perhaps you're um, you're a little bit skeptical that that can be anything meaningful at all, right? You're summing up infinitely many numbers. It might be a little counterintuitive that that could be um, something mi meaningful. That, that in particular, how could a sum of infinitely many numbers ever add up to anything, you know, concrete or finite or whatever? However you want to think about it, um, but. This is something that we've, this is sort of an issue, a philosophical, not, philosophical is not the right word, but a mathematical idea that um, we've encountered before. Remember when we had improper integrals, which were measuring areas of uh, regions, which had infinite extent, right? That, were, that wouldn't fit in our observable universe because they were too large, given that they were infinitely sort of wide or long or whatever word you want to use there, yeah? Um, and yet, such regions could have finite area. What we're going to find is a very similar kind of phenomenon here with infinite series. That there are series out there, there are sums of infinite of an infinite list of numbers which actually set very sensibly as we will come to learn the terminology, this is the terminology that we'll use, converge to a finite number. Okay? Um, this is what we're going to be uh, uh, learning about, is uh, convergence and divergence issues around infinite series. Now, I just want to take a step back because I want to orient you correctly as to why we care. Why do we give a shit about uh, infinite series? It's a good question. Um, the reason that we care for calculus purposes is because we're looking toward uh, uh, something called an infinite series representation for functions. And actually, that's a little bit too broad, in fact. We're going to be looking at one particular type of infinite series representation of functions um, called the Taylor series. Um, so that's coming, and it's very useful, and it's going to be the first in a suite of perhaps um, uh, uh, infinite series representations of functions. You'll learn about one later in life called the Fourier series, which is super cool. Um, but in fact, there are, you know, many, many, many different uh, sorts of these things, um, which are very useful in different contexts. But because this is calculus class, what we really care about are real value functions of a single real variable. And having a new perspective on such a general concept like function is useful enough for us to go through this um, whole process of uh, uh, of learning about these infinite series here. Okay, so what are they? they? Again, they're sums of infinitely many numbers, and we have a convenient notation for uh, the sum of infinitely many numbers. We have the sigma notation, and so here is a typical infinite series sort of in general. We write it like this. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n. All right. And the way we're going to mentally think about this, okay, intuitively think about this. This is not a formal definition. I, I, I'll get to the formal thing in just a moment. It is a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot dot dot. This goes on forever and ever and ever. Okay. That's what this infinity up here suggests. Okay? So that's an infinite series. Now, in my mind, infinite series are really just, they're a limit. Okay, uh, so I, hmm, whatever. I, I want to take back something I said earlier. I think I said earlier that infinite series are a special case of 
sequence. It's not quite right. What they are uh, is a uh, is a um, special case of limits of sequences. Okay. So what I want to show you are two sequences that we can always associate to an infinite series. One sequence is uh, the sequence of terms. This is the obvious one. So this is just terminology. Think of it as just vocabulary. Sequence of terms refers to the sequence a1, comma a2, comma a3, etc. That's the sequence of terms. Gosh, this is blurry. Can you guys see it? Maybe if I take that away, I'm not sure. Okay, that's the sequence of terms. And then there's another sequence that we can associate to this infinite series called the sequence of partial sums. And uh, this sequence is denoted SK. So let me just write out what these terms are, what, what, what this sequence looks like. So if you have something like S1, S1 is just the same thing as A1. Okay, so They're the same. S2, however, is the sum of the first two terms of the sequence of terms. So it's A1 plus A2. Clear? And maybe you can guess what S3 is. It's A1 plus A2 plus A3, of course. All right? And you can keep going in this manner. If you want to find the kth term of this sequence of partial sums, that's easy. You, we can exploit this sigma notation here. I mean, sure, this is A1 plus A2 plus dot, 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 all the way up to AK, and then we stop. But another better way of writing the same thing is as the sum from n equals 1 up to k of a sub n. These two things are exa exactly the same thing. Yeah? Hopefully that's clear. So that's what an infinite series is. And you can almost think of it like a definition. If you define the, the sequence of partial sums in this way, then what we mean by the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n, what this is, is the limit as n approaches, ooh, sorry, k approaches infinity of s sub k. Okay. This kind of makes sense, right? If, you, if s sub k is the sum of the first k terms, and then you let k run off to infinity, I think that very sensibly captures the idea of what we should mean by the sum of infin of these infinitely many numbers, uh, a sub n. Okay. So uh, I don't want to belabor too much. You know, we, we can talk about a lot of different examples, but I want to get very quickly to a very concrete set of examples which are extremely useful for uh, uh, in many different contexts, including things like mm, there are a lot of like engineering uh, sorts of uh, um, applications for this, which are a very special type of infinite series called geometric series. And these, this is a really good family of examples to know. Uh, not one because of its util. Uh, 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 one, because of the utility of geometric series, but also, two, we can completely understand geometric series um, in a way that will, uh, in a way that we can't understand other infinite series. There are lots of infinite series out there, and they, uh, believe me, are extremely exotic and weird and crazy, but geometric series are so well behaved, are so nice, that we can really analyze them fully and completely and totally. All right, so uh, let's talk about geometric series right away. Okay. So uh, geometric series are going to look like the following. Uh, definition. Uh, a series, sometimes instead of writing infinite series, I'll just write a series. A series is a geometric series if it can be written in the form 
sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a times r to the nth power. Hopefully this is not confusing. So what we write down as a sum, when n is 0, and okay, sure, I guess maybe uh, I'm starting my index n at 0 instead of 1 here. That's because I don't want to write n minus 1. I just want to write, I, I, just deal with it, okay? It's, what this means is that n starts at 0, and it clicks through the positive integers as usual, going, in, uh, going through um, all the way, right? Uh, through all the positive integers. And so over here on the sum here, we get a times r to the 0th power, but r to the 0th power is just 1, plus r, oops, I messed up, plus a r, rather, plus a r squared, etc. Is that, is that clear? So this, the nth power here attaches to the r, and a is just some dumbass number, okay? So a and r are numbers. Uh, do I have any restrictions on them? I don't think so. No, A and R are just any old numbers whatsoever. Uh, any a, any numbers whatsoever. Am I saying that? Oh God. Okay. Um. Yeah. So that's uh, a, a geometric series. So some examples. Um. How about we choose A to be equal to one, and R to be equal to one half. This is a very common example. Okay, so if we choose a to be 1 and r to be 1 half, then we're talking about the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 times 1 half to the nth power. So same people write that like this, 1 half to the nth. So what's the first term of the sequence of terms in this uh, infinite series? Well, that's what we get by taking n equals 0 and shoving that in. We get 1 half to the 0th power, which is 1. So that's the first term. The next term is when n is equal to 1. We click n up through the positive integers. The next term is then n equals 1. If n is 1, we get 1 half. Okay. If n is 2, we get 1 fourth. If n is 3, we get 1 eighth, right? Because 1 half to the third power is 1 eighth. And we keep going in this way, and we can write higher and higher powers of one half if we like, or we can just stop. Okay. And so what we have here is the sum of infinitely many numbers, positive numbers, in fact. And in fact, what we do, because this ha this series here has a particular structure, like this, all right? It's a geometric series. All right where a is 1 and r is 1 half. Is that clear? Um, I want to say now, because this will be important, that in looking at a geometric series, it will become uh, valuable for us to be able to, if we're not supplied it, if we're not supplied a and r, it'll be valuable for us to be able to sort of recognize with our eyeballs and our brain what a and r are so a okay a in a geometric series this is just you, you can take this statement to the bank all the way okay a is always the first term of the series the first term of a geometric series if you've identified a series as geometric the thing that's playing the role of A is always, always, always the first term of the series. R is the thing that you multiply the first term of the series by to get the second term. All right? So if you want to find R, what you can do is take the second term of the series and divide it by the first term of the series. So if we were not given, looking at this example... If we were not given this data supplied to us about A and R, it would be extremely easy to figure out what A and R are. A is just 1. How do I know that? Because A is the first term of the series, period. And I could determine that uh, R is 1 half. Why? It's not because R, it's not because 1 half is the second term of the series. It's rather because 1 half is the value that we multiply the first term by to get the second term. Is that clear? And you understand the difference. It 
it might not make any difference in this example, but hopefully you can see that it perhaps might make a difference in, in, in future examples. Yes? Okay, so um, let me, let, yeah, let me give you an example of that. Just thinking through. So if we have, for example, the sum from n equals 3 to infinity of 1 half to the nth power. So this looks very similar to this, except now we're starting at 3 instead of 0. Yeah? I claim this is still a geometric series. We just need to know what a and what r are. Okay? Uh, or I don't know if we just need to know that. I, I don't like the words that I use there. But uh, what I mean is, what are r a? What, what are a and r? So uh, if we write out the terms of the series here, we get 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth, right? So n starts, sorry, let me back up. I know this notation is mysterious to some of you still. So what we do is we start by letting n equal 3. And if we let n equal 3, we get 1 eighth. And then we click n through the positive integers. And if, as we do that, we get the subsequent terms of the sequence. Here's what that series look like, looks like. This is a geometric series, I claim. The reason I can... Okay, so, right. How do I know this is geometric? I know it's geometric because um, each term in the sequence is, can be obtained from the previous term by multiplying by some fixed value. In this case, in general, that, that fixed value is what we call R. And because every single term has that property, I know that this is geometric. And I mean, you'll come to recognize. You look at a you look like at, at a sum like this uh, or a notation like this. You should be able to recognize soon enough that this is going to be a geometric series. And what we know is that a is the first term of this series, which is one eighth. Okay, and r is the thing that we multiply by to obtain the next term. So that's going to be one half. Okay, hopefully that's clear. So these are geometric series. I just want to say something maybe about um, uh, uh, this infinite series right here. Perhaps you're skeptical about this infinite series. So let's think let's go back to this example for a sec. The sum from n equals zero to infinity of one half to the n. Uh, is this what I want to do actually? You know what? Let's start it at n equals 1 instead. Just for elegance sake. Because I, I, I just want to think about n equals 1. It's not a huge deal, right? I'm just leaving off one dumb term, so who cares? What is this? This is 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth, etc. So, we have a sum of infinitely many positive numbers, right? Um, and you might be like, how in the hell could a sum of infinitely many numbers like this ever um, be a meaningful thing? I mean, isn't it obviously just going to be some infinite quantity? Uh, but no, that's the magic of, uh, of uh, these convergent infinite series. This actual, this sum of numbers actually gets closer and closer and closer as we let the number of terms get larger and larger and larger gets closer and closer to some value um, and I claim that for this infinite series that value is 1 let's see why that's so I, I want to give you a, a cool argument or I think a, what I think of as being a cool argument uh, for that fact um, so I claim that this set of numbers is equal to 1 so what we're going to do is draw, I like geometry, we're going to draw a square. So there's a square, and I'm going to declare that the edge length of this square is 1. So then uh, I think you'll all agree that the area of this square here is 1. Okay, it's not very mysterious, right? Obviously it's 1. All right. Now, if I cut this square in half, which I can do in a number of different ways, then 
since the area of the entire square is 1, the area of half the square is 1 half. So I'm going to cut it like this. I feel like doing that. So here is a triangle of area 1 half up there. Okay. So what is the area of this piece down here? Also 1 half, right? <laughs> okay. But now what I'm going to do is cut this bottom piece in half again. And I'm going to do that like this, using symmetry. I think you'll agree that this piece down here then, what is the area of this piece down here? This triangle down here, this one. Well, since it's a half of a half, I guess that means it's a fourth. All right. So this piece also has area one fourth. So if I um, divide it again in half, that, let's see. So I'm going to do that again like this. This piece here has area 1 eighth. You agree? And we keep going like this. This piece here has area 1 16th of the whole. This piece here must have area 1 30 halves. 1 64th. 1 over 1 28. And we can imagine keeping this zigzagging line going on forever and ever and ever. Like that. And what we see is that the sum of all of these areas is equal to the, in the limit, is equal to the sum of the big square. And the big square has area 1, so it must be the case that 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 30, etc that this infinite series here should converge to 1. And we're going to see that. Okay? All right. Now, uh, I want to return to a discussion of these infinite series in general. Uh, here in... So I've got about 8 minutes left. Are there any questions? No. Nope. Uh, so remember what I said. Uh, geometric series uh, are series which can be written in this form. And uh, there are two parameters that are very important with geometric series, which are this A and this R thing. And what we would like to do is understand. Uh, we, we have a number of questions. Okay, let me back up. In thinking about infinite series in general, okay, what, we know, what we're going to do is interpret this quantity as a limit. Okay? It's the limit of the sequence of partial sums. That's the way that we're going to... Uh, understand this quantity here. And what we know about limits of sequences is that they can converge or they can diverge. All right? They converge if this limit, the sequence, the limit of this sequence here converges if this limit exists, right? If this quantity here gets closer and closer to some value. And it diverges if this uh, uh, limit here fails to exist, or if it's infinity or in negative infinity or whatever. Huh? So we apply those same adjectives, convergent and divergent, to this infinite series. Okay, An infinite series like this converges if the limit of the sequence of partial sums converges. Is that clear? So then, the question that I want to ask and answer, maybe not fully today, but certainly today and tomorrow, we will have an answer by the end of tomorrow, is whether or when, when is it the case that a geometric series like this, when is it convergent and when is it divergent? That's the question I want to ask and answer. Okay? When is a geometric series convergent and when is it divergent? Remember what that means. Convergent means that the limit of the sequence of partial sums, see this guy down here, that limit there is convergent. And divergent, th th that limit there exists. That's what convergent means. And divergent means that this limit fails to exist. Okay? So, yes, the central question, I guess, from here is when uh, does a geometric series like sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a times r to the nth power, when does this converge? 
uh, slash diverge. Can we supply some conditions, in particular on the parameters A and R, which will allow us to determine when this thing converges? So look back at the example I just gave and just suspend your disbelief if you're if you don't believe the argument I gave I think it's a very convincing argument uh, but you know I appreciate skepticism about that um this thing converges this is a convergent geometric series okay. and what was the key thing here well the key thing here is that uh, because we are chopping these triangles uh, in half over and over and over again what we get are these smaller and smaller triangles okay these triangles get smaller and smaller in area and here is the thing that I want to say they get small they, they get the rate at which they get small is fast enough so as to cause the sum of all of these things to converge okay that's the main idea all righty um, what? I'm streaming right now, A.B. That's okay. Hey, A.B., can you close the door? Thank you. That was my kid. Um, so, yeah, when does a geometric series converge or diverge? All right, so, again, just to frame this thing properly, let's remember what that means. This question about when an infinite series, uh, sorry, yeah, when an infinite series converges or diverges has everything to do with the limit of the sequence of partial sums. That's what's going on here. This is really a question about sequences, all right? When we ask this question about infinite series, we're asking a question about sequences, about a convergent or divergent sequence. And what is that sequence? It is the sequence of partial sums, all right? Well, here. This is the question that we want to understand. Um, God, what am I doing? Um, so I guess we should understand, try to understand what uh, the sequence of partial sums looks like. And maybe this will be the last thing I do today. All right, so uh, I want to talk about this. Um, so, yeah, let's say that we have uh, this, again, we have this geometric series. So we have the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a times r to the nth power. God. Um, okay. Uh, so suppose that we have this infinite series here. Uh, remember, this is a plus a r plus ar squared plus dot 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 so uh s i okay so n is starting at zero right so this is the zero term of the sequence that's the first term that's the second term i hope that doesn't spook you too much um so s zero is going to be just a s one is going to be a plus ar I'm, so S1 is just the sum of the first of the zero term plus the first term. Is this clear? S2 will be A plus AR plus AR squared, etc. Alright? Now what's SK? So I'm not going to write it using summation notation. I'll write it using this kind of dot 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 thing. Ooh, is this right? Okay, so what's SK? So it's A plus AR plus AR squared plus all the way up to AR to the K. Is that right? I think that's a little bit off because, um, oh, no, 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 that's okay. I'm sorry. I, I got spooked. I fence post myself. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, if you know what I'm talking, it's okay if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, no, no, this is correct as written. Good. Um, so can we find a better formula for s of k? That's the question, right? Because we want to be able to take the limit as k goes to infinity of s k. 
can we take a uh, can we find a nicer expression for s sub k than the one that we've got written here? Um, we can. Uh, and so let's try to do that. Um, let's see. What is the right way of doing this? Um, what is the right way of doing this? Um, <laughs> what is the right way of doing this? Um, oh, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I know what to do now. I, it took me a second. What we do is we multiply this expression here by R. So let's do that. I find this very enjoyable. So this is R times S K. Just bear with me if you don't believe. So what's R times S K? Well, we're going to take every term here and multiply it by R, correct? So that's A R. So that's A, A times R is A R. A R times R is A R squared. The next term multiplied by A R is A R cubed. Plus dot 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 plus A R to the K plus one power. Is that clear? And so now look at the sweet ass move we can now do. What we can do is take SK and subtract R times SK. God, this is beautiful. So we have SK minus R times SK being what? Well, notice, okay, so we're taking this line, this side here, and we're gonna subtract that side there, yes? This AR and that AR are gonna kill each other, right? This AR squared and that AR squared are going to kill each other. We're going to have massive die-off in the terms here. And the only thing, there will be two survivors after all of this, uh, uh, after the culling is done, after we have this sort of massive termicide of all of these terms here. The two things that will survive are the first term, this A here, and this very last term, A, to the, A times R to the K plus 1 power. That will also survive, but because we have this minus sign here, it'll get a negative sign. All right? So, now what we can do is we can actually solve this for S of K. This is an equation. We can solve it for S of K. And what we do is we factor out the S of K, and what we're left with on this side is 1 minus R, so S sub K, we learn, is equal to A minus A R to the K plus 1 divided by Oh, sorry. Uh, divided by um, uh, 1 minus R. And that is a fact we can take to the bank. Okay? Remember what S sub K is. It is the case partial sum of uh, the sequence of terms here. And because we're starting at n equals 0, maybe that's a little bit different than what we were talking about earlier, but it's more or less correct. Okay? All right. So hopefully we are clear on this. All right. So uh, I do want to uh, have you do a post lecture. Oh, I'm a little bit over time. I apologize. I'm three minutes over time, but it's okay. Um, I want to have you do a post-lecture slip. Uh, so what that means, remember, I'm going to send out an email soon, um, and I would like you to respond to the email that I send out so that I have things well organized and all of that. Um, I'll send that out in about 45 minutes. Uh, the reason I need to wait is because I want to be able to also provide you with a YouTube URL for this lecture, and uploading to YouTube takes time. Um, but I would like you to do a post-lecture slip on, on this uh, topic. So, uh, post-lecture slip, sorry, um, uh, for 4-7-2020. Uh, uh, I would just like to know, uh, what are you confused about? That's probably the most important question. But I'd also like you to tell me, what are playing the roles of A and R in the following uh, 
um, in the following expression here. So I claim uh, I'm just going to say this. This is a what I'm about to write down is a geometric series. But what I would like for you to tell me is what are a and r in the following expression. Um, so let's say we have the sum, the sum from n equals, uh, I don't know, let's say 2 to infinity of 2 to the nth power divided by 3 to the 2n plus 1 power. All right. So what I'd like you to identify are what are playing the role. I claim this is a geometric series. You don't need to tell me why it's a geometric series. I just want you to um, write down for me. Tell me what A, what is playing the role of A, and what's playing the role of R. Okay? All righty. Uh, and that's enough for today. Um, love you all. See you all next time. Oh, yeah. I'm going to open up a Zoom meeting right now. Uh, and actually, I guess I should send that URL out right now as well. Um, I'm not sure how this works. I guess I should send out the email right now, huh? Uh, and then maybe follow up with the YouTube URL. Or maybe I'll just point you to the channel, Adoy. That's what I should do. Um, Sorry, <laughs> it's, just, it's hard doing this from home. There's lots of distractions. Your kid walks in on you. You get texts and stuff like that. Um, I hope you all are doing well. Um, and if you want to include, you know what? Tell me how you're doing. This is the third thing I want you to tell me how you're doing. Because I'm very curious. And uh, I care about all of you. I want you to be well. All right, uh, love you guys and gals. See you soon. I'm gonna open up open up office hours now. Okay. All right, bye.